<laughs> Presenter of our main talk is uh, almost needs no introduction. Uh, very well known and beloved in our community. He's the vice president of our Houston Oasis Board of Directors, also heads up our finance team, and uh, he's spoken here before, and it's always awesome. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to our friend Eric Anderson. Thank you, Mike, for that introduction. You know, it always feels like every time I get up here, I get this overly generous introduction from Mike or whoever's emceeing. It sets the bar a little bit too high. You're writing a check on my behalf. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to, to cash here. Um, <laughs> I would like just once to get up here and be introduced as Eric Anderson, he's okay. He's all right, he's a pretty good guy, he does a pretty good job, so let's keep the bar nice and low. As Mike mentioned, I am Vice President of Houston Oasis, I'm also heading up the finance team. Uh, you know, I've had a real passion for finance my entire life. Uh, really, as soon as I found out that finance was more of a science, an evolving science, the science of how we choose to spend our money, which really taps into the emotional basis, the strongest emotional basis in how we make our decisions with money, I was hooked on it. And uh, I wanna talk to you about something that may sound a little bit academic, or it may sound unimportant, but it has a profound effect on everyone in this room. And it will continue to have a profound effect on everybody in this room. I'm talking about, of course, financial crises, right? And all of us have gone through many financial crises in our lifetime. Um, it's something, though, that in theory, in the perfect theory of an efficient marketplace, shouldn't even exist. Yet, it occurs on a regular basis again and again. Like I said, it has a profound effect on all of us as we experienced in 2008 and are still experiencing today. So I'm going to talk about two important things related to financial crises. I'm gonna give you some of the common factors that generally contribute to a financial crisis, so you can keep an eye out for those. And I'm also going to give you a more detailed overview of the causes of our most recent financial crisis. I'm talking about the subprime mortgage crisis or the Great Recession that occurred in 2008. I'm not really gonna have time to get into the long-term effects of the financial crisis, although I understand that a member of our organization has already volunteered to do that in another presentation. So stay tuned, you'll probably hear that in the coming weeks or months. So I'm going to point out to you um, any more resources where you can find out more about the lingering effects of financial crisis if you're interested at the end of the presentation. I'm gonna switch over to the portable mic here. The CEO, give it a second. Hello, hello, testing. Oh. Bernie made off. <laughs> hello, there it is, all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming in loud. All right. The CEO, the very well-respected CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase once said in an interview a couple of years ago, I was talking to my daughter. My daughter called me from school one day and said, Dad, what's a financial crisis? And without trying to be funny, I said, it's something that happens every five to seven years. Now, keep in mind, this is the CEO of one of the largest banks in the world is admitting that these things are extremely cyclical. They're always reoccurring. Well, let's test Jamie Dimon's theory just from our recent memory, something that everybody in this room should remember. All right, by a show of hands, in 1986, who remembers the savings and loan crisis? Everybody, okay, I shouldn't have my hand up. I was born in 1988. <laughs> but I heard about the savings and loan crisis. It sounds really bad. I'm sorry for all of you. Didn't take long, 1987, we had Black Monday. Does anybody remember Black Monday? Okay, that was the largest correction in the Dow uh, since the Great Depression. Uh, fun fact, the Black Monday actually started in Hong Kong and spread around the world. So if you're from Australia, where's Michelle? It's called Black Tuesday in Australia. <laughs> All right, we had a, a period of not a whole lot going on, a little bit of relief, but then bam, 1987, who remembers the Asian financial crisis? Not as many. This one, of course, happened in Asia. It did affect our economy, but not as dramatically. Right after that, we had the Russian financial crisis in 1998. I'm sure all of you remember the dot-com bust of 2000. Yes, that was when everybody thought the internet was gonna be this big thing, and it really just turned out to be a big fad, right? The internet, <laughs> who uses that anymore? No, that was, that was when people were pumping money into unprofitable internet companies because they were just a little bit over exuberant about how big the internet or how quickly the internet was gonna take off. And then of course, what I'm gonna talk about today, a little bit later, what we call the Great Recession, the greatest economic crisis to hit the world 
since the Great Depression. A pretty incredible event. All right, so in finance, we talk about something called the business cycle. We are aware that finance does not operate like it's supposed to. All right, things are not perfectly efficient. And so we have something called the business cycle. And it's a very emotionally driven cycle. The underlying causes of the business cycle, when we have an expansion, the participants in the marketplace are typically exercising greed and irrational exuberance. And then after it peaks and we have a recession, participants in the marketplace are typically exercising fear and panic. You can see evidence of this in every single financial crisis, and it happens again and again and again. What determines the spacing between a financial crisis? How long it takes us to forget about the last one <laughs> is the running joke. So to understand why we can have this rapid expansion in wealth, and then we can feel like there's a very sudden contraction in wealth is because that is actually happening in some sense. And it's tied to the way that banks operate. It's called fractional reserve banking, but I'm gonna simplify that down for this example to just fractional banking, okay? We all know how banks operate. They take money in from depositors and they loan money out to borrowers, all right? Well, what happens when they do that? $100 that I put into my bank is still my $100. I still tell everybody I've got $100 in my bank. But the bank is actually taking that money and loaning it out to other people. So they've got my $100. And guess what? They can say I have $100 too. And they spend that money in the economy and somehow it winds back up in another bank account. And they have $100. And this happens over and over. It's an expansion of the money supply that is completely determined by how banks are with their credit terms, whether they're loosely lending or whether they're a little bit tighter. You can actually physically have, well not physically, but you can have more dollars in the economy during times of expansion. Now, the business model of a bank, as I mentioned, take money in from depositors, loan it out, is pretty simple, right? So you pay the depositors less than you charge the people who are borrowing. That's called the spread. Now, it sounds like a simple business model, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because in that spread, you need to account for all of your expenses to keep from going insolvent. Well, that's pretty easy. Expenses you know, are, are planable and, and whatnot, but there's one thing that is more difficult to plan. You need to be able to cover all of the defaults, all the people who aren't going to pay you back for your money. And how can you possibly know who is gonna pay you back and who isn't? And after that, you either turn a profit or you become insolvent. So really, it's a fundamental question of risk as far as this business cycle. It's all about how banks quantify their risk of whether or not they're gonna get paid back on their deposits so they can decide how much of a spread they need to charge or how much they need to hold into reserves. And the challenge, like I said, is that they rely on historical data to do this. To be able to determine the probability, they just look at the past and they say, you know, buyers with this much money down, buyers with this credit score tend to default at this rate and so on and so forth. The challenge with that is that empirical data, historical data is not exhaustive, which means it does not include every possibility. It only includes what happened in the past, not in the future, of course. So the analogy I like to use is it's a little bit like playing a game of roulette. When you play roulette, you look at the board and you can see every single possibility that could occur, right? Imagine you're playing roulette, you're placing your bets, and a number comes up that didn't even exist on the board. All right, that's the challenge that banks face when they're trying to quantify this risk, is that things can change. And sudden, sub uh, substantial deviations from historical means can create unexpected losses for banks who did not account for this risk. When that happens, banks become insolvent. This is what happened during the Great Depression of the 1930s. And during the Great Depression of the 1930s, we didn't have the FDIC. Accounts weren't insured. So the people that were ultimately on the line, if anything went wrong, were the depositors. And they knew this. And so depositors, when they sniffed anything wrong with a bank, would rush to the bank and take their money out. And the act of them rushing to the bank and taking their money out and seeing that big long line in that group in front of the bank, it is a perpetuating cycle because people see that and they start to panic. And soon you have what's called a run on the bank. Everybody wants to get their money out before there's none left. They wanna be the ones that withdraw, not the one that's stuck with the loss, all right? So this is a very emotional response and it really is the result of a, um, 
Oh, what's the term I'm looking for? It's, it's, it's really the result of uh, uh, a conflict of interest, a moral hazard between the banks and the depositors. The banks do not have the same type of incentive to protect your deposits that you have and may take excessive risks. So there's a conflict of interest, there's a moral hazard there, and if the bank becomes insolvent, you're left holding the bag. Well, we fixed that, okay? After the Great Depression, we learned our lesson and we established the FDIC, all right? The, the Federal Depository Insurance Corporation. Yes, it is a corporation, it's private. It is uh, technically not the government. Uh, kind of like the Federal Reserve, it operates independently of the government. There's many political reasons for that. We can get into it another time. But the FDIC solves this moral hazard, this conflict of interest, by offering insurance to all accounts. And right now, the amount that they insure is up to $250,000 per account, not per person. That means you can open up as many accounts as you want to split your millions and millions of dollars up, just so you guys know. <laughs> In exchange for offering this service to depositors, the FDIC requires that the bank meet a reserve requirement which is where the fractional reserve banking comes from. So now, depositors put money in, and the bank has to post, right now the requirement is 10%, 10% of that money with the Federal Reserve into an account, which historically did not earn interest, it actually does earn interest right now, but it's still only a quarter of 1%, so that they can ensure that banks remain solvent in the event of a crisis, and also so that there's not as much panic from, can, from depositors wanting to get their money out in the case of a crisis. They know that they will get refunded for that. All right, now this, this does two things. Like I said, this ensures depositors do not suffer for the risky behavior of the bank by eliminating that moral hazard. But it also gives the FDIC a little bit of control over the expansion of the money supply. Banks have no incentive to put their money into their reserve accounts. They don't want to put money in their reserve accounts. They're still paying depositors for that money, but they're not loaning it out. They're not getting anything in return. So generally, they post the absolute minimum that they can. However, um, if the FDIC wants to prevent banks from loaning out excess money, wants to slow things down if it looks like riding into bubble territory, they can just raise the reserve requirement and ask banks to post more, which contracts the money supplies slightly, hopefully deflating whatever bubble they're trying to deflate in the process. Now here's something interesting. The Federal Reserve started publishing the data of excess reserves in these accounts in 1984, sorry, 1984. That's where I got the data from. Uh, they started publishing this data so that anybody could look at it. And again, there is no incentive for banks to post more money than they should, right? Um, so the fact that there's anything in here at all is really the result of uh, banks probably just trying to meet liquidity requirements, thinking that they're going to have to post excess reserve next week, and so they top it off a little bit. And this is just loose change. This is millions of dollars over here. $500 million for every single bank in the United States is not a lot of money. However, you will notice that there's these spikes on here, right? Which is very interesting. Times when banks irrationally are posting more excess reserves than they're required to. Why on earth would they do that? Well. Turns out that the spikes correlate exactly to financial crises. Times when everybody is in a panic mode and the banks are thinking, where's the safest place I can put my money? We'll post it to the reserve account. We know it's always gonna be there. So that is really an indicator of how much fear is in the banking system when you look at the excess reserves. To prove my point, you can see I'm going from February 84 to August 01. I'm gonna add one month of data to this chart. That's September 11th, 2001. <laughs> Banks posted a record $20 billion in excess reserves because of the fear of the terrorist attacks on 9-11, okay? Look at how small these excess reserves were from other financial crises. Look at what happened there. All right, now, let's take a look at this data today. This little dot, you can squint and see it, is September 11th. This is what banks have posted to date in their reserve accounts right now. All right, this graph should tell you something very interesting. First of all, that banks are still terrified from the effects of the financial crisis. This crisis brought the global banking industry to its knees in a way that it had never done before. And also, that one fifth of our entire economy is sitting in a bank account right now. $2.8 trillion is tied up in a bank account 
earning 0.25% interest. It's not out there creating jobs. It's not out there loaning money to people so they can get houses and they can pay for college educations or whatnot. It's sitting in a bank account doing nothing. What's gonna happen when $2.8 trillion suddenly floods the economy? Will there be massive and unexpected inflation? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, we'll just have to find out. So, leading up to the Great Recession, could anybody see this thing coming? There was kind of an attitude that it was very sudden when it happened. Nobody expected this whole thing to happen, right? Wrong. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to see the Great Recession coming. You did, however, have to be a Nobel laureate and an economics professor at Yale. This is Robert Schiller. And Robert Schiller has a very successful track record of predicting <coughs> global financial crises. Just one example, in 2000, Robert Schiller predicted that the stock market would crash. One month later, the dot-com bubble happened and it crashed. And then again, in 2007, Robert Schiller wrote an article where he predicted an imminent collapse of the housing market and subsequent financial crisis. Not long after that, things started happening and eventually one year later, the market crashed. So what did Robert Schiller see that the rest of us did not see? Well, Robert Schiller was thinking about home prices. And he was thinking about how over the last 10 years, home prices had been increasing dramatically. And he thought to himself, you know, homes are non-productive assets. After they're built, they don't provide any additional value. So why is it that a home price would be inflation? There's this idea out there that people buy homes and it's gonna go up and up and up and up and we're all gonna be rich, right? Well, I mean, if that were true, then that should be true with any non-productive asset. It'd be true with gallons of milk. In theory, if you bought your house with gallons of milk in 1980, you should be able to buy your house with the same number of gallons of milk later if they're all productive assets. But it's not. Homes are increasing in their cost of gallons per milk, too. And they're increasing in their cost of loaves of bread. We're using these as inflationary metrics to try and gauge whether homes are outpacing inflation. And they should increase with any type of inflation-adjusted item, absolutely anything. But they were, they were growing beyond other non-productive items. And so Robert Schiller came up with something called the Case-Schiller Index. It was something that had never been done before. You think about real estate, it's one of the oldest markets in the world, right? It was probably one of the first things ever traded was land or real estate between settling people. However, nobody's really done a very good job keeping track of what happens to the value of these things. Until Robert Schiller came along and he, or more likely his grad students, dusted off all the old records and compiled them into a database. And he went back hundreds of years. Now, his index, because he is a capitalist, is for sale. So I wasn't able to buy it, but I was able to get this snapshot of it that goes back to 1975. However, he discovered something. When you adjust the value of homes, real estate, and land for inflation over the long term, over hundreds of years, they never do anything. They never exceed inflation. There are times when they'll temporarily grow, but then they always revert back to the mean and pull right back. Your home is not an investment. If there's one thing you should take away from this presentation that you haven't already learned from the financial crisis, it's that your house is an expense, not an asset. So he saw that, and then he plugged the most recent data in. This was in 2007 when he did this. And he noticed that there was an enormous deviation, larger than it ever occurred in history in home prices. This dotted line represents inflation. Remember, everything in this chart is inflation adjusted, so inflation is flat. And this represents home values. Home values had dramatically increased beyond inflation. And if his theory was correct, then this would have to revert back to the mean. And we were going to see the largest correction in home prices that we had ever seen in history. Well, he turned out, unfortunately, to be correct. The reason why we saw this drive up in home prices was largely psychological. There was a paradigm shift in the mentality of everyone in America that your home was an investment. That you buy a house and next year it pays you back even more. The year after that it pays you back anymore, which was completely irrational and unsustainable, but it was being taught like gospel that homes are your biggest investment. And this type of mentality, when people made the mistake of buying into it, their instinct was then, of course, to buy the biggest home you could possibly afford or even worse, to speculate on the price of real estate. To buy a home, not to use it or to rent it out, but to just sell it in two years because it'll be worth more. It's free money, right? Yeah. That's a big problem. 
So we talked about moral hazard in the retail banking sector. Well, the retail banking sector is not what failed this time. It was the shadow banking sector that failed us. And the shadow banking sector is the sector that handled all the mortgages. Traditionally, you think about getting a mortgage from a bank, you go into the bank and they evaluate your credit worthiness, they want to verify your income, they want to see if you have a big down payment, because they're holding the buck if you don't pay. They want to make sure you're going to pay, right? Well, the system that evolved of buying, packaging, and reselling mortgages to investors meant that the person originating the mortgage, after they originated the mortgage, they would just immediately sell it to somebody else. So they did not care if you made a payment on it or not. There was an enormous moral hazard that removed the requirement or the incentive that banks even care if you can pay your mortgage or not. All right, so there was no accountability in the system. And furthermore, the real estate speculators who were uh, just wanting to buy a house so they could flip it later, they were getting mortgages called ARMS, adjustable rate mortgages. An adjustable rate mortgage gives you a low fixed rate for the first two to five years, and then it resets at a very high floating rate. But they didn't care. They were going to be out of the house in two to five years, and they will have taken all their money and run away. However, that assumption relies on the value of the home always going up. If you're sitting with an adjustable rate mortgage and the value of the home doesn't go up, or, <laughs> heaven forbid, goes down. Am I allowed to say that, heaven forbid? <laughs> well, anyways, forbid, the value of the home goes down, you're left holding the buck. You have to pay off that mortgage or you're liable for that mortgage. All right, the last piece, of th the last piece that fell into place that helped perpetuate the global financial crisis were credit default swaps. Now, if you watch Michael Moore's documentary, uh, Capitalism, A Love Story, he tries to make the case that credit default swaps are this big exotic instrument that nobody really understands. And you know what? He's wrong. They're actually really simple. Credit default swaps are nothing but an insurance contract. There's a buyer of the insurance contract and there's a seller of the insurance contract. And the event that triggers the insurance on a CDS is when somebody defaults on their mortgage. So it's tied to a specific mortgage or a pool of mortgages. All right? So investors aren't stupid. They were buying these collateralized debt obligations, these mortgages, because they were offering superior market returns because mortgage rates were higher than traditional fixed income rates. And they knew that their biggest risk was default risk. And so they also bought credit default swaps to hedge against the risk of the mortgage going under. Well, the problem was is that credit default swaps were completely unregulated which means they weren't on an exchange, and it means that nobody was making sure that the people entering into these agreements could actually make good on them. It's called counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is when you take a bet with somebody, you have the risk that even if you win, they're not gonna pay. If I made a bet with Gary Williams on a sports game, and I won, I know I am exposed to enormous risk that he's simply just not gonna pay me when I win. Right. All right, that's counterparty risk. Exactly, and that's exactly what ended up happening. The largest writer of these credit default swaps was AIG. They were the ones selling this insurance to investors. They were the ones that would have to pay it if anything bad happened. All right, so all the pieces are in place. Let's see what happens. Like we said before, the only thing that needs to happen to trigger this time bomb, to set these dominoes into motion, is home prices have to fall. How long does that take? Well, it takes 10 years, but eventually, home prices do fall. Mid-2007, in most major metropolitan cities in the country, we start seeing home prices default. When that happens, not long after that, we start seeing mortgage delinquencies go up. When the mortgage delinquencies go up, that means that the collateralized debt obligations, the value of these mortgages, are suddenly not worth what they formerly were. Which means that anybody who was holding on to these things and trading in them is liable to lose quite a bit of money. In this case, August 2007, Bear Stearns was the one holding the bag. They had billions and billions of CDO liabilities on their books, and they were drastically trying to reduce their leverage. January 2008, Countrywide goes under. Bank of America buys out what's left of them. Countrywide, they had those commercials on. They were, I mean, man, they were just, they were the icon of the buildup to the financial crisis. They had commercials pushing you to refinance, no money down, no credit check, no income requirement, whatever. Of course they were going to die out, and they did. Not long after that, Bear Stearns loses their last grip trying to hang on, and they have to be bailed out by the Federal uh, Reserve of New York to the tune of $25 billion. 
Let's be clear about what a bailout is. I think there's a common misconception that a bailout is like a free check. Like, here, have $25 billion, go take more risk. No, it's a loan, and it's a very expensive loan. One of the things that the Federal Reserve does, and they have been doing since the Great Depression, is they act as the lender of last resort. When nobody else is out there willing to loan you money, the Federal Reserve has the power to step in and be that lender so the financial system can keep moving. All right, now things really heat up. Okay, this is the month of September 2008. September 7th, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, were the government-sponsored entities that are collateralizing mortgages, go bankrupt. They have to be taken over by the government. A little over a week later, Merrill Lynch goes belly up, has to be bought out by Bank of America. That same day, <laughs> Lehman Brothers declares bankruptcy. No good news for Lehman Brothers. Nobody bailed them out. They went belly up, and what was left of their assets got sold off. They exist in no form that I'm aware of anymore. The very next day, AIG, American Insurance Group, requires a bailout, a loan, of $85 billion so they can meet all their obligations on the credit default swaps that they wrote. Um, interesting story about AIG. Uh, I'm actually, um, I'm not sure if this is true or not. I heard it from a professor back when I was in business school. But he said that AIG throughout the entire financial crisis was having daily phone calls with the Federal Reserve. They asked me, say, hey, how are you doing? You think you're going to make it? And they would say things like, I think we're going to make it to the end of September. And the next day they talk, I think we're going to make it till about the middle of September. And then eventually, AIG calls the federal government back and they says, I think we're going to make it until 3 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and they required a bailed out post haste in order to make their payments on these. Not long after that, Washington Mutual goes belly up. JP Morgan Chase buys them out. All right, the crisis continues. At the end of the month, Congress this whole time has been debating this bill called the Troubled Asset Relief Program Bill. And it's basically the government stepping in and buying up all of these subprime mortgages, putting them on their own book, so that way hopefully the value of these things and there's enough liquidity in the market that everybody else can liquidate it for a huge loss still, but we can keep the financial markets churning, right? Well, Congress rejects the $700 billion bail on the 29th, and the Dow has its worst day ever in history. Worse than the Great Depression. Thankfully, or not thankfully, depending on your political viewpoint, uh, October 3rd, Congress passes the TARP program. Uh, a little bit later, the Federal Reserve steps in, has to rescue Citi. And then by the end of the year, by the end of 2008, the effects of the financial crisis begin spreading outside of the financial sector. Everybody starts feeling it, and one of the uh, organizations or one of the sectors of the economy that is most susceptible uh, to economic recessions is car companies. Uh, because car companies are considered a large purchase, and consumers, when they're feeling tight with their money, generally don't go out and buy new cars. They just make the old one do just fine. Well, the Treasury Department authorized $13.4 billion for GM so they could keep making terrible cars, and $4 billion for Chrysler. Fun fact, Ford never took a bailout. They were offered one, and they said no. I don't know your opinion, but I have a little bit more respect for Ford after that. All right, so like I said before, I really don't have the time to get into more detail about what happened after that. I mean, we all experienced it. Uh, but if you'd like to know more, there's a couple of good books I highly recommend. All the Devils Are Here. And you'll notice it's by Bethany McLean. She's the same author who did the Enron Smartest Guys in the Room book that was so well acclaimed and the subsequent documentary. And also Fooled by Randomness is pretty good. Uh, so thank you. We have, uh, we have time for...